we get started? So uh, I'm, I'm actually quite excited to talk about this because over the last year, a lot of things really came together and there's like really something, something to show, something that's actually usable and, and uh, extensive enough to, to be played, like to, to, be, to be actually used. Um, and yeah, don't forget to, to rate <laughs> the session later. Um, and you may know me from my involvement in, any, in some of these projects and organizations, um, X.AI in New York City, um, which is a cool place if you're looking for a place to work at. And so what is CBT? Well, it's a, it's a general purpose build tool which is optimized for being used with Scala. And it's also a way to just call Scala methods straight from bash to just invoke different things you may want to do, just a launcher in a way. It's also a set of just plain, stupid, simple libraries that just do build-related stuff, like compile source files to class files, or package sync things up into a jar, or uh, yeah, uh, invoke stuff reflectively, just these things as like simple helper functions and a bunch of them. So they're like independent of CBT and just usable and um, could be even used to build a different build tool or something. And it's a way to compose your applications. I mean, you have, you have like, I mean, you can depend on dependencies, but you can also depend on other builds, and it's it's very uh, flexible there. You can uh, compose uh, across Git directory, uh, get across directories or Git dependencies or like on GitHub dependencies. All right. So wh why would I work on a build tool in the first place? Well, I struggle with the existing build tools for various different reasons. Too complicated, too slow, hard to extend, or, or hard to debug. Like, for example, if we look at the Maven build of Spark, there's a script in there, like a 50-line bash script, which what it, what it does is it replaces the Scala version in the POM file so that they can cross-build against a different Scala version. And that's already, when you already have like to struggle with simple things like this, it's, it's so, but, uh, yeah, so, so for one or other reasons, other build tools were, were not what I was looking for exactly. But some things of, the, of these other tools were really nice. Was anybody at the SPT talk earlier in the same room here? A lot, of, a lot of what this talk was about is something that I believe as well, that your build tool can really enable you to automate a lot of stuff. And it should really be simpler to use this tool because then you can automate all these chores, all these like, scripting tasks basically that you have using all the tools you're familiar with and concentrate on, on creating new things rather than just doing this, the, these chores. Right, and so that's why I care about this topic, but why would you care about CBT or why is CBT something that might be interesting or an interesting way to do this? One is it's, it's very fast, so you can invoke it straight from bash and it usually has response times uh, of under 100 milliseconds. We'll see that in a second. It's, it's powerful in that you don't run into stuff like having to write a bash script to replace your Scala version to cross build. It's, it's an expressive enough model to express all these things that you want to express. Oh yeah, we've seen that. And at the same time, it's simple, so it's actually very easy to use. It uses very few building blocks, um, much fewer than, than SPT, for example, uses to pull this off. So it's much easier to understand what's actually going on and you can even, like, even with very basic Scala knowledge, follow mostly what's happening. And it's largely trying to just minimize incidental complexity by really just providing the essential things that are, that are needed. And since it's using Scala, it's really, it's, it's familiar. And it's not magical. There's no like crazy weird lookups that you don't know what the semantics are. And just simple vanilla Scala code and that also means it works with all your tooling, like type, the type checker will give you message, messages that actually mean something in the context of your build. The debugger in IntelliJ works. Scala.doc reflects what your build is. You get code completion, you can do print line debugging of your build properly. And uh, it's easy to learn because it is just Scala. And there are lots of examples as well. We're still working on like uh, creating more docs. And that's one thing I'll, I'll concentrate on over the next few months. And uh, Taking away some of, like, that's, I guess, the more people pick it up, the more we'll notice, like, some just obvious pitfalls where people just miss something simple, which is not nothing fundamental, but just, oh, okay, yeah, maybe that wasn't obvious. So we'll, we'll work on reducing those. 
And it's really built for contribution because the code base is really, really simple. It's really like there's no like very few implicits and, and no like type level programming, no monads. It's entry level code in a way, but it, it was sufficient for to solve this problem. So it's easy to contribute to it and understand. But it's also something because I contribute to a lot of libraries. I want my tool to help me make that easier. So it's, it's very easy to, for example, swap out a library that you depend on as a Maven dependency for the source code, patch it, run with the patched version, wait for the PR to get merged, then switch back to the, and it, and it I want this to, to become simpler over time as well. Because that's often an obstacle for people to contribute to projects, such as such a hassle to just get all the tooling set up for. Right, so let's, let's actually look at, at how it works. Right, so let's create a main file. Um, just because I've written that so many times by hand, I just want that. Okay, and uh, the easiest build is you don't have to do anything. Just use all the defaults. Just let's, let's just run it. Here we go. It compiles it, run, hello. Fine, okay, that works. But obviously, as soon as we want dependencies, we want a build file and specify what we actually want and all that. So let's create a build. Here we go. Then this is really like the response time to get, right? Instant, basically. Well, it won't happen the second time because um, okay, so now I had to compile something, but now when it doesn't have to compile something, it's that quick because there's a background process running. Yes? <laughs> well, it's, it's basically, it, there are two things that, that make these runs slow. One is class loading, and it caches class loaders in the back. And it, unlike many, unlike many of us run their applications, and SPT invokes applications as well, it doesn't use a single class loader for everything. And she builds a graph of class loaders that corresponds to the dependency graph, so it only has to invalidate the class loaders that, that actually changed. Everything else is there, that's why it's fast. And, and IO is another thing, like, so it caches some file stuff. And Yes? Um, I don't know, but you can switch off that mechanism, so maybe Native just does wouldn't need that mechanism because it's already fast without class loading. I don't know. So it will be interesting to port that. Yes. It's, na it's, uh, it's nail gun. So the launcher is a C program that connects to the J background Jevy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it actually ships. It actually ships with a tiny C. But <laughs> Yeah, no, um, when, it's, when it's ever getting slow. Okay, so we just created a build file with this helper script. Here's the build file, it just generates a bunch of like stuff which it's easier to delete the things you don't need than, than write them from scratch. So we'll just need, let's say we just need those. They, you can provide dependencies in the syntax that SPT uses just so it's easier to copy and paste stuff, but I recommend using the, the constructors. And let's use, uh, just for show, this library, um, which we're using in our uh, testing tool chain. So uh, we're saying, okay, resolve it from Maven Central. This is like the, the artifact ID and all this. Um, and now, uh, yeah, now we can just go ahead, okay, import. What this, what this little helper does is uh, just diffs case classes. So, um, uh, sorry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> C is a shortcut for compile. I, I just don't want to comp type compile every time, yeah. Um, okay, so there's a type error, not enough arguments for diff. Oh, okay, it's a comma. Right, so um, now we added a dependency. We just imported our library that we can run this stuff. And it does obviously do the resolving all this stuff in the back, right? Uh, so CBT currently has, like, it has its own resolver implementation. I want to add support for course here as well. Um, but the, the resolver that, that I implemented for CBT is actually really fast and it supports well, there was one library at work that it didn't support, which we only used for debugging. But basically, it does supports just regular Maven dependencies. It does not support version ranges. It does not, does not support IV. But uh, adding courses support should, should fix that. It needs to be 
smart enough to download Corsair, then we're all good. Like, um, okay, let's get back to the slide. That was the, oh, oh no, let me show something more. So basically, um, what we've done here, CBTC or CBT run, what this really translates to is a method call here. We can just define our own method and call that. So we can do uh, CBT hello, and that will be our own method. And the, the methods test or run or something or compile, those get just inherited from, from this basic build that you extend. So you, your build is a class and it has methods in there which are the things you wanna do. Um, and you can call also like de deeper into your interior object graph. You can like say you have an object in here. Um, so you can also call hello baz. So hello dot baz. And this, this allows you to very easily add functionality, add tasks, but also structure them and not have it all in like in one large scope. Yes. I mean, it, yeah, it's like it's like it's like an FPT. Like you, you need to, or, or in and as well, you need to define some things to do: compile things, run things, upload things to GitHub. I don't know. Uh, create your documentation. A plugin may want to add another task for formatting your code. You just can't call methods straight from Bash. What's what's easier than that? Um, okay. Right, and it turns out that this nesting and this, that classes are, turn out to be the basic building block that's needed and that's all, and we'll get to that in, in the end. And you can express all these things like scoping and multi-project builds and all this with exactly that. So we've seen basically everything you need to express all kinds of builds, but we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, okay, so what's the state of the whole project? Well, the core is complete, so you can express any kind of build that I, I could possibly think of. Um, and uh, this code base is still relatively small. It's like 3,600 lines of code, out of which, uh, yeah, and, and uh, these 1.7K uh, lines of code in separate libraries, and I want to transition more over so that the core shrinks more, and uh, the libraries, which are just basic, just helper functions, They're, there's nothing interesting going on there. Uh, becomes bigger. There are a lot of plugins already. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not a lot of code to actually read or review. Um, and it does need a bit more cleanup, so I want to particularly reduce the core so to make, to make it simpler and, and uh, rename some things, but the, the features are there. And there some, will be some minor breaking changes, but nothing, nothing major. And needs more documentation. There's some already, also for contributors. Okay, the, the number of plugins is, is constantly growing. There, a lot of interesting ones are there. Uh, some you may miss, and particularly there's currently IDE support missing, but there will be a student, uh, Google Summer of Code student, uh, working on IntelliJ support starting in two weeks over the summer, so that we should see that coming. And it's, it's for early adopters who are fine, who are not necessarily using IntelliJ and who are fine with like uh, circumventing the occasional usability issue, it's, it's ready to be used. If you like want a completely polished product, you may want to wait a few months. So how does it actually work? Okay, let's, let's zoom out for a second. What, what is a build? What, what do you need to, to build code? Well, I, I break it up into these three things. One is you need just basic building blocks. Here are the, the path source files, put the class files there. Here are the, uh, the paths of a bunch of files, put them in a jar file or Here's a URL, download this file to this directory. Just, just these helpers, right? And then this way to invoke things, which we've seen how you do it from, uh, from Bash. And then you need a way to combine all these building blocks into actually doing the things you really need, like compile your code and compile your library before your application. And so chaining them all together so that you can invoke the right things. And uh, right, so the building blocks, um, are, are these libraries I talked about. And let's look at uh, one of them, or some of them. So I'm not sure how clearly you can see this, but they're, they're, they're the libraries that exist right now. There's like some stuff related to files, some uh, just shared things, um, some specific things for plugin where 
uh, there are ways to invoke Scala test, there are ways to in invoke uh, Scala tech as, as libraries. Then there are some things which have not been separated yet from the core, which is, this is one of the files, which is really, it's just uh, a long file with little helper methods that are independent of everything else. Download, take a URL, take a file, take a, a SHA to verify that it's actually matching and, and download it. Or, I don't know, pick one. Like you often want to kind of show a dialogue or which main method do you want to run? Um, okay, so, and, and helpers like this are generally fairly easy to understand because they're not coupled to anything. They just take everything they're working on as arguments. Okay, and, and I want to kind of take these larger files and move more out into smaller pieces. Um, so this is the stuff that's right now supported out of the box. I I'm probably forgot some stuff. Um, I mean, compiling, running your code, creating Scala doc, testing, like running tests, creating a dependency tree for showing what your dependencies are, forking your, your uh, execution to a different thread, a different, different process. Uh, many of these I want to actually move into a plugin so that Scala support really becomes a plugin rather than just being in the core. Um, you can have dependencies on Maven and Git and Git repositories or directories on your disk. You have, we have the looping thing uh, where like in SPT you can have the tilde, it's not called tilde, it's loop. Um, you can just loop over changes. It will detect changes in your sources, will detect changes in your build file, will detect changes in CBT itself, and when anything changes it will just rerun and rebuild. Um, yeah, and it has the, the expressive clean model for all these advanced things that I'll get back to in a minute. And right now there are like about 25 plugins available for like all the formatters and all the linters and all the compilers that, that we kind of need. Native is not supported yet, but Scala.js is um, build info, uh, Scala meta, Scala paradise. Yeah, IDEs are missing still, as I said. Those are kind of the more important ones people use. Just highlighted some the fat ones. Yeah, okay. So, right, defining and invoking tasks. So we already have seen how it does work, but uh, let's, let's zoom out a little bit. Um, if you wouldn't have this runner that, that CBT comes with, what you could do is you just write a main method, right? Uh, let's say this, and then you pattern match on it, and you say, okay, if you have compile. I mean, at least that would be very simple to, to understand. You didn't know exactly what's going on. You're just invoking the main method. Um, and the way to, to think about what CBT does is really, okay, since you're, you're, you don't want to write this for every single build, let's just basically take this and move it here and, and make these as def. So basically, unlike Java by itself that looks for a main method, CBT will uh, look for either method given, given a string and, and invoke that method. And instead of, uh, well, instead of taking just arguments, which now we, that we have many methods should probably be moved to, the, to this level, and now it needs to be a class. Instead, it, it has a context object which has not only the arguments, but also things like the directory that your current module is in and a bunch of other things, some caches and um, so, and, and this is how you basically end up with this structure that CBT uses for its build. So that's what the build looks like. There's a build, there's a context, and then you have like methods on this thing which you can just invoke. And they might call each other, like run may call compile because it needs to compile the code first before it runs. Uh, yeah, okay. So now we have a way to invoke stuff. Um, and one that's actually also composable so that you don't like code your build against, I don't know, user.dir, which only works if you really invoke that build, but if you use it as a component in something else, then it's not the directory that you started in or something. Um, right, and this caching background process is something that really gives the performance. There have been other talks where I talked more about that, but it's really, I mean, just keep it up running and, and keep the class loaders around. And yeah, cache invalidation is always a little bit tricky and there have been, like it was, this was probably like the class loading and cache validation was the thing that took the longest to get right. But uh, now it's, it's working very, very reliably and that's really nice. Okay, so now that's, that's the most interesting part. Okay, we have all these helper methods. We have a way to invoke stuff. 
how do we chain it all together in a way that's actually understandable and manageable? And uh, well, let's, let's think a little about it. Build configurations are graphs. They are directed acyclic graphs of things to do, right? So it could look like this. You have CBT run, which invokes the run task or method or whatever, and then that calls compile, and maybe compile calls Scala version because it needs to know which Scala version to use, and then calls class path, which may call the resolve method in the library, and compile also may call zinc, and run may call like some helper methods to like do reflective lookups or invocations. Okay, the right thing, the libraries are fairly simple. It's just a bunch of uh, flat helpers. Um, but the graph in the middle is the interesting part, particularly um, because it's like irregular. It's not like a binary tree which has the exact same structure. It's, it's yeah, it has lots of different pieces that are all different. And uh, that's also probably why, why some people struggle picking up Git because it's an irregular graph that has not a clear structure you can repetitively think about. Or SPT, it's one, probably one of the reasons why build tools are considered hard because just that graph is hard. And especially when you have multiple projects, now it's getting, it's getting more complicated because I have this larger graph, right? So um, how, do we, how do we make this easier to work with? Oh, first, actually it's even harder than I showed because you're not even having these complicated graphs. You're even working with patched versions of them. For cross builds or these things, you like take that graph and patch it in different ways or for Scala C options in REPL but not in compile or things like this. So you have to man manage to kind of understand enough of the graph to work with it but also understand that there are different derivations that behave slightly differently. Right, so how, not, how to not drown in all this complexity? That, that really comes from our domain partly as well, right? Well, one is we can just at least reuse known mechanisms to work with it. If, if we can describe the graph in a way that's very familiar to us and with, with rules that are, are very familiar to us, then it, it's going to be easier to work with. So if we use Scala and the JVM as our language to express graphs and the JVM is the interpreter to run them, then it might be simpler. And I don't mean a DSL or a custom interpreter that happens to be implemented in Scala running on top of the JVM, but really Scala is sent like, essentially Scala itself and the JVM is the interpreter. So how can we really in core Scala without writing a library for it, express graphs? Um, okay, quick detour. What do we get doing? What will we get doing that? Well, if we do use Scala, the developers and the tools understand Scala. So you understand Scala. Scala compiler understands Scala, can give you good error messages. For example, error messages about did you really define or use the, uh, did you really define the task that you're, that you're trying to reference? SPT doesn't check that. SPT fails at runtime, well, build time, which is not the end of the world, but it's, it's different, like a task not found error in SPT is different than a compile error. So you'll have to separately understand how to deal with that. IntelliJ, um, yeah, all these tools understand Scala. So how do we, right, how do we actually use Scala to express graphs? Well, defs in classes from DAGs, like they're from graphs, like a method calls another method, calls another method, and, or calls multiple methods, that's a graph. And inheritance allows patching these graphs. So here's a graph, right? This could be our, our compile tasks and they call each other and they, they do stuff. And in order to patch them, we just put them in a class and subclass it and patch it. So this is a basic building block and that is the basic Z1 basic building block that you need to express all these things. You don't need, like, you don't need scoping, you don't need axes, you don't need uh, uh, multi-projects build as a, as a kind of a concept or something. You just do classes, you can nest them into each other and you can, can override them. Right, so you mean if you have, so okay, how do you deal with multiple inheritance and like conflicting yeah. fields? I'll, I'll get to that actually. Um, okay, so let, let's do something small. Let's, let's, let's write a tiny plugin basically. Um, uh, let's write a tiny plugin that says, uh, let's with x print typer. And that plugin
just add something to the Scala C options. Um, right, yes, Eugene. Uh huh. Uh, let's 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 take this later. Let's let's play. Okay. So now we basically patched our build to have more Scala C options in a way that we could reuse. I mean, this is a silly example, so we probably can't just put it in there. But okay, we we did reuse it. Um, we can put this. I don't know in a library that our build consumes as a library, and we patched our graph. So if we run this now, we should see uh, that the compiler prints, prints the type information. So let's clean first. Um, if, if, if I don't clean it, doesn't, it notices it doesn't need to recompile. Yeah, I think it, it, currently it ignores the options. It's different from what SPT does, yeah. Okay, so now, now we saw this. Okay, but now, Yes, there's a, there's a good question. What if you have two plugins that somehow collide? I mean, in this case, it's, it's just adding onto something, so maybe that works out. But if a plugin adds a new method and you have two of them that add the same method, they might collide. Yeah, but basically what you can do, instead of just mixing them in, you can also say, hey, you can just scope it, so to speak, right? You can say def with x print typer equals new build with this. So now you only get this if you call this method. So you can really kind of selectively uh, enable plugins in a scoped way if you want. Well, we have this method, right? So we do with x print typer, and then this is a build, so we can just do dot compile. And we have to clean first, right? Right. So this composition really allows to kind of nest this stuff very nicely. Um, okay, and this solves all this stuff. You can do multi-project builds by just putting several class instances in the same scope that you have access to. You can do cross builds by looping over a list of versions and creating multiple subclasses with the different versions. You can do scoping the way we did it. Um, plugins work. Yes, Adrian? So the question is how, how do basically changes in dependencies cascade? Um, well, every individual dependency uh, has a notion of uh, when did it last update? So if it reads the compiles, then that updates, or if it re-downloads, then that updates, and these timestamps are propagated through, and then you can see if your dependencies are newer than you, you need to recompile. No, so, so uh, the composition of modules and dependencies is something that CBT is aware about. So just by specifying uh, by specifying this list of dependencies, there is a graph of dependencies that build up that, that this thing can reason about and build sequentially or yeah, in a cascading style. Oh, I see. So uh, in general, it invokes them every single time and every individual method is responsible for caching if it thinks it needs to cache. So compile itself caches and doesn't actually invoke zinc every time because zinc invocations are slow. So it's not really like controlled by the compiler. It's something that's happening in the code after the compiler. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's not something where the engine is aware of the graph and then selectively runs stuff or not. It's something where everything's run every single time and the graphs individually decide, uh, the nodes individually decide, do I need to do something or don't I need to do something? Yeah, Stefania. Yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so the question is, can you run individual tasks in parallel? 
and it's since uh, this executes on the JVM and the JVM runs these graphs in a particular sequential order, it doesn't happen automatically. You could do it ad hoc if you, and uh, so something that's easy to do, uh, which I haven't built in yet, but since it has a notion of the individual projects, it can compile projects in parallel, but the tasks within a single project, um, you would have to use an explicit mechanism like, hey, I need these four things, just run them as futures or, or in some way and then gather the results. So it's explicit, it's up to the user, it's not something that the engine does. But in the end, it is very fast. And that's the thing that, that, have, that, that matters, right? So if you do stuff in parallel but you're not ending being, end up being fast, then, then... so, uh, okay. <laughs> Um, right, plugins are super easy, it's just traits. You can just create one, I'll, I'll show you uh, more in a second. But wait a minute, so this is inheritance, right? Didn't, didn't we all know that inheritance is hard? Uh, yes. The code, yes. Oh yeah, that's just an example of some object. Uh, you do get tab completion from the shell. I'm not sure if it's working right now, but um, well, it explores the graph. It explores the dynamic object graph right now, which is a, sorry? No, it, it just, um, right now, I mean, right now it's one level deep, but if it would be multiple levels deep right now, so I, the, I I'm, I'm, thinking we could do tab completion on the shell in a way that you uh, explore the type graph rather than the actual runtime object graph, but right now it explores the runtime object graph, which means, however, if we go more than one level deep, that it will invoke stuff and run stuff just to predict names, which is something that's still a kind of a call to make if that's actually a wise thing to do or not. Maybe not. Um, but, you, but you do get stuff like this where you say CBT compile and then you can complete it and you see here, uh, you see all the things that are in your build. Yeah, exactly. So, right, but that's, that's, that's how it works right now. Um, okay, so isn't inheritance hard? Didn't we like, isn't that the thing that we try to avoid because it's really hard? Um, and uh, yeah, because patched DAGs are hard. And when you can avoid them, you should avoid them. The problem is that builds classically are patched DAGs, so there is no completely running away from this. M maybe there is, so I think it's actually, we're close to the point that we might want to experiment with like writing builds as really do you have a main method and just invoke the library function and chain them together by hand without using this pre -configured, these pre-configured classes and just configure them for your build. But right now, SPT and, and CBT as well give you a pre-configured graph, basically, which is a class which you can patch. But there's something you can do, which is really reduce this to only the things that need to be in this graph. Have everything else separate. So you can limit the number of things you have to reason about in terms of the graph. And uh, what can you do instead? Well, you can use composition. So, for example, if we look at the ScalaFix plugin, or the ScalaReform plugin, let's look at that one. This is the trait that's mixed in. It really adds one key. And this key is typically named like the plugin itself. It doesn't add more. And when you want to reconfigure something, this is actually an object, a case class, this one down here, which has fields that you can just copy. You do just do dot copy and change it. And then when you call this from bash, this is an object that has an apply method. So in that case, it's actually run. So here, def apply actually does stuff, but the way you see it in your build is an object that you just can dot copy, and then a lot of most of the configuration you do is not within the graph. It's just a stupid dot copy op case object where you can reconfigure things in a very simple way. This makes the graph small, it makes it easy to reason about, and then uh, hopefully allows you to stay on top of these things. But yeah, inheritance and patch tags are hard, and to some degree we'll have to, to deal with this hopefully as little as possible. So yeah, let's make it as simple as possible, but there's no, no complete hiding. Um, 
Right, how much time we got? Uh, a little bit. So, uh, okay, let's just skip this. Ports, there's something fun, which is, uh, since CBT knows something about Git, repo like Git repositories, you can just specify your sources to be located somewhere in a Git repository inside of a path, which makes it very easy to pull in sources from other stuff. Also makes it easy to, hey, this library, I just want to use some of their sources or use it as a module in my stuff and patch it a little bit or something. You can just pull it in, which is, which is nice. Oh, dynamic overrides is also fun. So let's do that. Um, is command line overrides. So now what you can do is you can actually go ahead from bash and say something like cbt with override def scala c options equals sec, I don't know, dash x print typer. And now we do compile. Actually, I think we have to clean again first. Um, okay, you get a type error in the string you just provided. Okay, let's see. That's because Scala C option overrides nothing. It has to be Scala C options. Okay, we have to clean first. Otherwise, there's nothing to compile. Right, so there's a kind of a nice way to just go, go ahead further and patch your stuff. And that I mean, we're in a build tool, right? So we can compile things like this. And it it's, turns out being fast enough. It can be even faster than this. Right now it's running on uh, on Twitter eval, but but I think actually it shouldn't. It should probably just create a file and cache that and, and build that because it's faster. So right now I actually let you, before you delete any files on your disk automatically, type something and show the list until we're confident enough that it like doesn't delete your slash or something like this. Because that's, that's a problem if you build a tool and if, if there ends up being a bug, so while it's moving fast, hopefully at some point we can just, we will, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm always remembering this, this Steam, this ticket on the Steam issue tracker where somebody updated Steam and then it deleted his hard disk because they had like some bug in the bash script or something. Okay, so uh, bootstrapping Dotty, let's get into this quickly. How much time we got? Five minutes, okay. <laughs> Um, so basically, let's just do this, right. So I'm just triggering the, the bootstrap of Dottie, but basically, um, so here's the, here's the build file for Dottie, CBT's build file for Dottie. And uh, that's the build object, that's the one you interact with, which extends this shared trait, which all of these objects now share. Shared is over here, it has a bunch of these things. These are the individual sub-projects, so this makes it basically a multi-project build. Um, there's some extra stuff here for it, like dependencies and things. Um, some Scala C options enabled for everything, and, and Scala default Scala version, okay. And then, well, then you have like your project. So this is the interfaces project, name interfaces, directory dotty home slash interfaces, uh, no dependencies, then you have the library that's non-bootstrapped, which um, dotty library in the dot library directory. Actually, we're compiling the same source code to two different locations, right? So we have the same, basically the same project directory twice with different target directories. So this non-bootstrap one compiles to slash target slash non-bootstrapped. Okay, it has some dependency, fine. Um, and So, right, and okay, non-bootstrap compiler depends on the library that's non-bootstrap, which is this thing in shared, which is just an instantiation of this. So you kind of trickle down every, every time, like depending back on the last thing. Okay, now we have just, this is just compiling it once with Scala. So the first, when Dottie bootstraps, we first compile Dottie with Scala C, and then in the second iteration compile Dotty again with the Dotty that will produce from the first compile. Um, right, so okay, so up to this point it's just compiling Dotty once with Scala C, nothing, nothing, else, nothing super interesting. But then um, now we have this use non bootstrapped compiler and with custom Dotty, which is a, actually, I think I need to add. Okay. 
Right, so there's this uh, trait, which is a plugin, which has the compiler abstract and the library abstract, and then you can provide your own library and compiler. And the way you do this is you just say, okay, this is the non-bootstrapped uh, compiler, which is an instance of this class, and the non-bootstrapped library builds basically are the same, like behave the same as dependencies. Whenever you, you, wherever you could put a Maven dependency, you could also put a build. So that's, what, that's how you can just depend on a local build on, on your machine. So now we basically told the Dotty plugin, hey, the compiler to use is this compiler, which is just one build here. And the library to use is this library, which is just, just a build here. Um, and then when we mix this into a, a actual project, then this project, because of this plugin, will be built with Dotty instead of Scala C, and we'll use this, this compiler in this library. So now this will be something that will be built with Dotty instead of, instead of Scala C. And the same for the compiler as well. So we, uh, we extend the same thing. So that one will also be built with, that com with the compiler uh, and the library compiled with Scala C. Um, right, and then we do the same again for the bootstrap one. So now we have this thing that something can mix in to use the bootstrap compiler and the bootstrap library. And well, the tests need that, right? So the tests extend this and then add a bunch of sources and uh, set some system properties because the Dotty tests require that and then run them with, uh, yeah, depending on the bootstrap compiler in this case because they're testing the compiler. Yes, Eugene. What logic? I'm not completely following. How you implement this this self same thing? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, there's an SPT file for the Dotty, right? Like, oh, or, yeah. right. So okay. So Dotty Dotty is built with SPT. We're experimenting with building it with CBT instead. And this is this is basically how the build file for it looks like. And I I do like to think it looks like fairly clean and straightforward and like sequential and and. Uh, what do we have here? 90 plus, plus this, I think, which is another 40, 50. Okay. I mean, it, probably the build file for, uh, the SPT file does a bit more than this right now. But yeah, now we should see that it's like compiled with Dotty and you see the nice Dotty, like when you compile Dotty with Dotty, you get a bunch of warnings because the same source code has to compile with Scala C and with Dotty, but this is how the warnings look like in Dotty. So Dotty now compiled something here. Um, yeah, here it's where Scala compiled it. Yeah, uh, that's, that's uh, I guess, all I got. So if you want to join us for the future of Applied AI in New York City, do some fun Scala stuff, that's, that's us, X.AI. Remember to rate the session. That's, that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> Any... Any more questions? Let me see if I have time. Uh, yeah, I have some time. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, Andrew. Most build frameworks, whether it's Gradle or uh, well, not so much Ant, but Maven, and, and a lot of those, they they seem to believe that it's necessary to be able to reify the, the class graph, not the dependency graph, but the class graph, and they do fancy stuff with it, like you know, figure out when you have cycles. And I I'm guessing there's a oh, here we go. Wow. <laughs> I'm guessing there's a fundamental kind of design contention here that that's actually not necessary. You can just rely on stuff called cycle, then, then, then that's kind of your own fault. I mean, I mean basically, yeah. basically it's like this. Um, yeah. Most of the time when we, when we write code, mm -hmm. we don't stage this code into a, re, into a introspectable format. Most of the time we just run it straight away. Oh, yeah. Sometimes we do, but most of the time we don't. Um, so basically the idea is like how far can we get by just basically using it straight out, meaning we get the debugging, the type errors, the tooling support, the understandability, all this. And so far, it's, they haven't hit a roadblock with that. Um, there might be some very advanced things that, that may not work out well this way, I don't know, but so far it looked all very straightforward. Um, yeah. Another quick question, just to, to clarify. Each, so there's no variable or argument passing. Like everything goes through the context. Like if you want one thing to produce something and then you want to access that in another method that you call later. Because like, if I looked at the defs that you were showing, there were all no argument Yes, methods. right Right now all yeah. the defs in the classes are 
are uh, no argument defs. Mm -hmm. um, I, eventually, I want to want to get to a place where you can pass arguments straight from Bash. Um, but uh, right now, you have to configure these main things inside of inside of your class. However, that's really limited to to only the essential things that really need to be overridden this way. Everything that's somehow possible to cap encapsulate in something else is encapsulated in something else. Dimitri. Hi, Chris. Thanks for the wonderful talk. So one of the complex builds that I'm aware of is the SBT build itself. Have you considered trying to build SBT with CBT to I, prove uh, that CBT is better in so, building SBT? So I, I actually, I actually have it's because basically I want to, I want to, I wanted to patch zinc, so I had to figure out how to build zinc, which is a part of SPT. Um, I, I don't know, I couldn't figure out what to, what to. It's, I mean, I didn't spend like days on it, but it, it wasn't super straightforward to figure out. And I did manage to invoke SPT from CBT as a, uh, as a Maven dependency and like run an, S S an SPT build from CBT, but it had the same overhead like launching the shell like five seconds or something, or 10. So that was like not exactly satisfying. Maybe I'll manage to kind of speed. Would be kind of cool if you could invoke yeah. SPT builds from CBT faster, but I don't know. We're not, we're not, we're not there. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Um, I was just curious if, you're building it into a form that's not introspectable. Um, does that make it, wouldn't that make it a problem for integrating with an IDE like IntelliJ or something like that? So the main thing that IDE, so it, yeah, the main thing that IDEs care about is the module, the graph of your modules, right? The different modules you build and your dependence and all this. And that is reified introspectable, that graph. Um, and, you can, I mean, right now it tells Bash what the tasks are that you can call. It can intel, tell IntelliJ as well. I, I don't see anything obvious. It's completely possible that, that I just don't know something yet. And since it's starting soon, like the de IntelliJ development starting soon, we'll, we'll run into this, but I don't, I don't know of anything. Um, plus, there, there is still something we could do in the longer run, which is try to, since these classes are, are all known and, and uh, simple enough, we could try to actually analyze the, the code graph and maybe get introspectability out of that with like Scala Meta coming about and, and all this. Yeah. Regarding uh, IntelliJ integration, IDE integration, so we do have some introspection of the tasks in Gradle are now putting this into uh, SPT support for IntelliJ. So, uh, that's not directly possible yet, right? Wait, do you have introspection of what tasks exist? Or do yes. you have introspection of what tasks other ta what tasks other tasks call? Like, do you know what tasks compile depends on? Not just, yet, no. You just know the compile exists. Right now it's just yeah, exists. That, that's but super, it's that's perfect, super easy. Yeah. But of course it's perfectly possible with SPT to uh, yes. actually analyze the, the task the graph and is, make it the, the question available. is, do we need it? And yeah. Do we do we pay this complexity cost for something we get, or do we pay it without getting anything out of it? I don't know. Yeah, you tell me. <laughs> if it's useful, I might implement it. <laughs> yeah, how's the support for like more like customized assembly tasks, like building Spark jobs or um, you know complex Uber jars and stuff like that? So um, I've, I've not tested on Spark at all. Mm. Like, there's no like cool. uh, Spark yeah. stuff or containerization or anything like that. Um, there is an Uber Jar plugin which really just does only that and has a disambiguation. Uh, like, you can give it a function that that basically decides how you dis how stuff is dis disambiguated. And there's nothing equivalent to native packager or something like this yet, which would give you a runner script or yeah. But it's it's really not that. I mean, for I mean, obviously, I'm I'm biased because I know CBT very well. But for me, it's quicker to write an, a CBT plugin than understanding the SBT plugin, typically. typically. But for a lot of things. Uh, so maybe I missed it um, during the slides or something. But I didn't one hundred percent understand how you can set settings. Like in SBT, you can say, "Here's a setting," and then all the tasks use it. Right. So we did this a minute ago, uh, like this. So you can basically. 
from the command line say, hey, override this thing in this way, which under behind the scenes will create a subclass that overrides this method in that way, which is the equivalent to setting. It's a bit more declarative, but. No, yeah, but those are like, the, those are settings, that, like that's an override for an existing setting. I mean, like me setting as like a setting key in SVT where I, I make a setting. Oh, uh, well, what do you want to call the setting? Um, I'm, I'm not sure now. <laughs> um, Look. Yeah, there you go. Foobar. Okay, let's let's create foobar. Def foobar. I don't know what what do you want it to do. Uh, I don't know. Five plus five. Yeah, there you go. There we have a setting. There we have a valid like a thing. It's just Scala. Anything that works in Scala, yeah, sure, you can do. A good example would be password or something like that. From like the repository to the public. And in this case, you probably don't want to push the same file because it doesn't need to be called and you don't want to push password. Yes, so, so you can do something that like reads, I don't know, uh, something like that, right? And then my, my uh, password.file or something like this. Um, you can make it private, then you can call it anymore from, and, and you can uh, then just use it here. I don't know. Uh, uh, you mean as a feature? Like, yeah, like library, right? Oh yeah, I mean the, the lab, there are lots of library functions that do lots of stuff. There's like interacting with resources, there's, it's, it's all there. You just need to combine it yeah, in, in the ways you want to. Um, <clears throat> I'm guessing the B and the T stand for build and tool. What does the C stand for? Well, I mean, I, I thought it was compositional, but then everybody started calling it Chris build tool. So that's, <laughs> that's what it is now. I, I wanted to, I wanted to become the community build tool. So hopefully that's, I think Martin had a question earlier. So in, in, in terms of the, the architecture and uh, philosophy, this looks, uh, quite a bit like SPT07, which was uh, the last time SPT merited the name Simple Build Tool. Um, <laughs> so one reason that was given at the time for giving up that approach was that uh, essentially trait linearization got in the way with some of the more complex graph patching uh, operations. Uh, did you notice any, any so of that kind? Is, been, does that I've ring a bell? To... I've been trying to figure out why it was canceled and have tried to contact Mark and a few other people. Nobody could tell me so far, so it's interesting to actually know this. I'm, I only have it second hand as well. I mean, well. If you, can, you can decide the order by in which order you mix in things, and if you really try to minimize the things where you do overrides, and I, I've, not, I've not run into problems. Mm -hmm. um, and it's Scala code, so if you want to do something else, you can usually break out into some other behavior, write a function that does that. Um, it would be really interesting to know what cases they ran into. I actually, so I have used SPT07 like once or twice way back, but I had forgotten about it until I showed CBT to you like a year ago. And then I was like, oh, did I just rebuild something that somebody else? Owned? Then I looked into SPT07 again and realized, yes, they have done this whole model with like calling methods basically. Um, but there was already, I think probably Maven heritage or something, a lot of additional complexity that, that I managed to get away without. Um, like, yeah, basically just having classes and overrides as the basic building block and not using, not having projects and not having, uh, uh, I'm not sure if they don't think they had scoping, but, but there are a few more concepts in there which were necessary. But then when you have these overlapping concepts, then they all like are slightly differently supported and you try to, you have to re-implement the behavior that's actually the same for all of these different versions of the same thing. And, so this kind of yeah, there, there was this Ivy thing that SPT was relying on Ivy. So do you do the same or do you? No, I, I've actually written my, my own resolver just okay. originally to see how much work it would be. And so, and, and so I've, I've, it's like 150 lines or something and it gets basically all Maven features that I could realize except for version ranges and no Ivy. Um, but I, I wanted to be powerful enough to download Corsair and then plug in Corsair. Mm -hmm. or for everything. Right, right, thanks. Yeah. 
or yeah, oh, one more. Uh, so, if you were to put a val, like what what would happen instead of a def push? Like, does that cause CBT to get? So confused? vals are pretty tricky with inheritance with the initialization order. So, um, and and lazy vals are something that have limitations with overridability at all. So basically, what CBT does, everything is defs. And actually, classes in CBT are entirely stateless. There's nothing in the class. You can reinitialize the same class anywhere you want. There is one caching, one cache that's passed through everywhere in the context. And any kind of state like caching of, of uh, the dependencies or the class loaders, it's all in there. So interacting with classes doesn't have a lot of the problems that inheritance classically has, like managing state and these things, because it just there is no state. And, then the individual tasks can decide, or the individual methods of the libraries, like compile, can decide to use that cache to store some specific information for them. Like, oh, if I if I know my source files are not newer than the file last time I compiled, then I don't have to re in, in, uh, reinvoke things or stuff like that. So. Uh, that was kind of a, a leading question to the other part, which is, it seems like if somebody was just getting started and you know, kind of poking around and learning this, it, some of the problems that you might find is that it's um, that we, there would just need to be some restrictions added on to just the vanilla Scala. So something like wart remover or, or some similar concept of like, don't put lazy vowels or vowels always yeah. use defs. Um, I, guess, I, guess linting, I guess some linting rules might be, might be a nice idea. I thought about just documenting this, but linting is probably better, yeah. Like by default, you have a linter enabled that just tells you not to use vowels. Like, that's a good idea. Questions? How can you resolve super dot something in? Oh, right. Uh, so super dot something. Um, basically, I, I suppose your question is if you have to do super dot something everywhere, that's pretty verbose. Is there a way to get around this? I mean, we can write another parser for Scala, or we can, <laughs> uh, like, in doubt, I personally prefer taking the thing that we understand. And if I have to type a few more characters, that's fine, as long as I can reason very clearly about the model. Um, but if, if something like this creates a use case for potentially opti like specializing Scala syntax, maybe even in the official Scala repository, like in a way to make things like this easier because everybody starts using this and we have a use case for simplifying it, I think that's, that, that, should be a, that would be the approach, I think. 